Hello, my name is Patrick Corbett and today I'm going to talk to you about what I believe uh, to be rock typing. In this wall, a, a geologist might say, oh, there's a number of types of rock. There's some sandstone, and there's some basalt, all held together by cement. So for a geologist, rock types might mean really lithology. I put my hand there on a piece of sandstone, fluvial sandstone, uh, within that sandstone, because you can see the structure, we probably have more than one rock type within one sandstone. In the field, this is more obvious. Uh, when you are looking at fluvial sandstones, we have a nice outcrop here from the uh, coast just to the east of Edinburgh. And you see a sandstone outcrop there, which has got clearly different types of sandstone, different property sandstone, even at the fine scale there you can see the lamination contorted lamination and each of those laminae will have a different rock type so yes one might call that a formation uh, one might call that a crossbed set but uh, for a petrophysicist that's a, a mixture of two types of rock essentially a fine grained and a coarser grained rock so with that, we introduce the fact that rock typing is essentially a petrophysical uh, determination. And so uh, we like to call it petrotyping uh, to distinguish it from this confusing rock typing, perhaps. Because it is controlled by the petrophysics, by the pores and the pore throats. And pores and pore throats are related by capillary pressure. So you can see this quite simply on capillary pressure curves, which we'll talk about shortly. And the way that we've taken the approach is to look at work, original work by Mufli, uh, which was derived from the cassini carmen capillary bundle model. This is one of the fundamental equations. Uh, we introduce the rock quality index and the FZI as a way of characterizing porosity and permeability clusters. Define those clusters a priori uh, before we start looking at any data uh, by ISO FZI lines and this is a bit like the field geologist will use grain size classification doesn't mind too much exactly what the grain size is but is it fine medium or coarse and these concepts were introduced in this petrotyping concept was introduced in 2004 so here's a capillary pressure curve on the left there you can see that initially you have a rock 100 percent saturated with water, that would be the wetting phase. And as oil migrates into there, after a certain buoyancy uh, overcomes the threshold pressure into which the oil can evade, then the volume of oil within the rock uh, increases steadily until it reaches some irreducible water saturation uh, at some buoyancy pressure, which is equal to the capillary pressure in PSI. So on the right, you'll see what happens when we have a very well sorted porous system with all the pores the same size, large throats perhaps, very low threshold pressure, very rapid increase in saturation right across the system to reach that irreducible water saturation. On the other hand, if you have a really mixed, poorly sorted sandstone, a range of entry pressures required to enter different pores, increasingly the smaller pores are being entered, it can take quite a long time for the saturation, the wetting phase saturation, to reduce to irreducible. It's important to note at this stage that the rocks with the high uh, entry pressure may not be the low porosity rocks. In this case, a 20% porosity rock only has a 1 millidarcy Darcy permeability. A Darcy permeability here with a very low threshold pressure uh, actually only has 12% porosity. So porosity and permeability here is not directly related. And so that's something that we need to bear in mind as we go through this. The drainage, so that's the water draining out of the system as the oil migrates into it. Remember there is also the imbibition part of the curve where you are flooding the reservoir with water uh, and you're returning the uh, water saturation to some uh, residual oil saturation so that uh, there is always going to be some oil left 
So that's the uh, imbibition curve. We are interested in saturations versus height, so uh, we can then define our PC equals zero. That's usually we, what we call the free water level, where the threshold is overcome, then that's the oil water contact. Uh, one definition of the oil water contact because we start to see oil. We then have a transition zone and above a certain saturation or below a certain saturation we'd be into the uh, oil zone and we above that we will produce dry oil. So within the transition zone you might produce some oil and some water. So there might also be a, another definition of the oil water contact. Oil water contact may be defined as a 50% saturation or maybe as an inflection point. So there's a number of ways you can define an oil water contact, but remember the free water level is where capillary pressure equals zero. So that's a fairly firm definition. And that's what we would see if we were to plot the pressures in a well, the oil gradient pressures within the oil column sitting on the oil gradient, pressures in the water column sitting on a water gradient, the intersection of two would be at the free water level. And so you can see uh, because oil is lighter than the water, the uh, buoyancy is driven by this difference in oil. Uh, the capillary pressure is overcome by the buoyancy driven by the density of water, as perhaps uh, the difference between the density of water and the density of oil. So in a rock where we may have different petrophysical types, different capillary entry pressures, different characteristics, uh, we might have three different capillary pressure curves, a good and a poor and an intermediate one. And so from the free water level, uh, if the rock at the free water level is the moderate rock, then the part of the capillary pressure curve will then define the saturations. As you go into good rock, you might suddenly see an increase in the oil saturations, a decrease in the water saturation. Going into some poor quality rock, higher in the reservoir, you may go into fairly wet rock, and that uh, could be confused with a, a separate contact if you're not aware of the petrophysical driver on saturation. So one has to be careful to identify and understand the distribution of rock types in your well in order to understand the saturation distribution. Alongside that we have a, a very small scale image but it kind of illustrates where we would see a good quality rock in the coarser grain sand, the poorer quality rock in the finer grain sand. So here we see the effect uh, in a real reservoir, Rock Legander's reservoir from the Ork field, uh, where in the transition zone we have a interbedding of oil saturated sandstone and water saturated sandstone. These are the two rock types that we saw in one of those pictures of a wall on a building in Glasgow earlier on. The next slide shows that the texture is really driving this, the grain size is driving this, where the porosity in the two rock types is quite similar, but the uh, grain size is different and that causes the permeability to be very much higher in one of the rock types and that is reflected in the saturation Another way of looking at that is to imagine different pore systems here rather schematically along with fractures. We might be thinking here of a, a more um, carbonate type system. The big pores, the big fractures would have an oil water contact in the macroporous system close to the free water level. Mesopores and in the micropores you're going to have uh, water higher in the very thin fractures, you're going to have water higher in the system. Free water level then uh, would define the, be very close to the oil water contact in the macroporous system, but you'd have different contacts in the microporous system. So to illustrate uh, simply how one might decide how many rock types there are uh, within a reservoir, we introduced a template based on the Amufili arrangement of the Cassini Akam equation. We looked at the equation uh, which relates the flow zone indicator which is a, a porosity uh, normalized rock quality index. The rock quality index is porosity and permeability. 
permeability divided by porosity, square root of, would be the rock quality index. And then you have a normalized porosity on the denominator there. So recognizing this, we just allocated in a logical series uh, a number of FZI values where we allowed the FZI value to essentially double in, in a series. And then we defined 10 global hydraulic elements. Uh, it doesn't mean to say that you can't have porosity and permeability occurring above this area of colored ISO FZI clusters, uh, or below, indeed, in unconventional reservoirs, you quite often are dealing with rocks below this. But for many normal, clastic, carbonate reservoirs, we lie uh, somewhere within this diagram, up to 50% porosity, up to 1,000 Darcy permeability. It's usually enough to, to cover for most eventualities in a reservoir. This uh, little spreadsheet is available uh, from the university, and the contact is down there. So when you see carbonates, because it's quite nice to, to we all know, we all think we know what a chalk looks like, uh, a fairly simple, homogeneous, fine-grained carbonate material, then you see that whether these are North Sea chalks or Middle East chalks, they lie in those lower bands. So these are fairly high porosity rocks with very low permeability, typical chalk and uh, the color green was chosen because the uh, chalk is often Cretaceous, Cretaceous is often colored green, so we started with this color scheme. And we get into more clastics, we tend to see more yellows and oranges. Carbonates, of course, can have a very wide range of rock types, so in this particular case we see one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. In this case we'll see seven uh, rock types, even though it is one formation, it might have seven different rock types in there. And so this takes quite a little bit of work in carbonates, and we're not going to go into that in great detail to separate and understand what these different rock types, what is driving these different rock types in such a variable system. Sometimes you can see uh, separate clusters. You might see a chalky cluster in a carbonate, and you might see something that's more meso or even macroporous as in this Middle Eastern carbonate. There are other rock type methods. Uh, there's a Windland equation, which also has uh, lines, uh, essentially, uh, they're not straight lines on the porosity log permeability, they're curved lines. The Windland relates the pore throat radius. So here the pore throat radius is related to the porosity and the permeability. So there's a model for the relationships between pore throat radius porosity and permeability, and that can be used to define the uh, very large pores, megapores, from macropores, mesopores, micropores, and nanopores. So this idea that there are different pore types, uh, particularly and with carbonates, is, is critical to the understanding of rock typing. Looking at cap pressure data might be another way of looking at this. You can see the data down there. Uh, on the saturation versus the height above free water level. If you put that on a log scale, you have the plot above, and then you can uh, use the R35, which is the windland definition, to define the rocks that lie um, to, to the left, essentially, of that line would be the megapore. Then you can also define a cluster which is macropore, mesopore, and micropore. This was done for a, an, a US carbonate. So on a plot, a little bit messy, but you can see what happens if you overlie uh, windland lines and what we would call global hydraulic uh, element lines. They uh, are fairly similar in, in terms of their clustering. Similarly, uh, a Middle East driven rock typing scheme, the Shinawi rock typing scheme, uh, there, the clusters are very similar, they just have to be closer together in size. So there is this issue about how uh, precise do these uh, rock types need to be defined, and we would say that approximately for any given porosity, somewhere around an order of magnitude for a given porosity is, is, a, is enough.
Jerry Lucia uh, introduced the uh, Lucia rock typing scheme uh, based on different classes and you can see those are quite dramatically different so looking at data and understanding what type of rock scheme rock typing scheme it comes from is probably a good idea the advantages of rock typing were laid out quite nicely by Shinawi in his paper back in 2009 because you know these rock type clusters uh, capillary pressures and J curve uh, from various core samples cluster together by rock type numbers you can cluster relative permeability curves you can cluster connect water saturations you can cluster residual oil saturation so all these things are important in reservoir simulation so it is through rock types that essentially we deliver uh, porosity permeability and other petrophysical properties into our simulation model so it's naturally the link between the geology and the engineering also rock types are uh, are useful in the prediction of permeability because if you know the porosity and you know the rock type then you have a much better definition of the permeability. So some examples if you compare if you like a shallow marine sandstone and a chalk we've already seen a chalk very fine grain very uniform fine grain rock that would all form within a fairly uh, tight band high porosity low permeability uh, something like global hydraulic element one Whereas in the shallow marine examples, you see this trend from global hydraulic element one through to somewhere around six. And that's a function of the grain size and the sorting. And you can see how we're crossing boundaries. We're attempting to draw a line through those data uh, and put this back into one rock type with a fairly steep relationship. But it makes more sense to show this uh, stepping up of rock types as you go up through the shallow marine sequence. In a North African reservoir, uh, it was quite nicely uh, illustrated the numbers of rock types we had. Uh, that allowed us to choose some nice samples uh, for which we could do some special core analysis. And when we did that, we saw that the good quality rocks were all high porosity, uh, nice clean pore sizes, and the uh, fine grain rock was uh, much dirtier. And you, that helped to sort out the capillary pressure curves you can see the nice range in capillary pressure curves uh, taking the inflection as the oil water contact in this case you can see how each of those rock types would have a different oil water contact uh, sometimes as much as 400 feet above the free water level in other areas of petrophysics we also see uh, if we measure the saturation exponent here that's the archie n uh, what we see is that in many sandstones that's close to two. Uh, as you um, go to the very cleaner sandstones, uh, you, you might see that drop to something like 1.8. As you go to the more shaly sandstones, uh, the more silty sandstones, the more tortuous sandstones, you might see that rise to something like 2.5 or, or more. So, so saturation exponents, uh, which we might need for calculating saturations, are also uh, rock type uh, dependent. So it's a nice example that we worked with uh, in a summer project with Muad. Uh, Muad was able to show the rock type variation in an interval of uh, braided fluvial sands. You see the geological description, a series of channels. So that is a braided fluvial sandstone, sand plus shale plus silt. And you can see how uh, the different rock types there uh, um, occur at scales that are really quite small uh, down to uh, the sub-meter scale and of course that raises an issue of uh, how do we upscale those but that's another discussion but what you see here is clearly that uh, in this one braided system geological rock type uh, we, with a number of lithological rock types we end up with a number of petrophysical rock types and it's the petrophysical rock types that we're interested to for the reservoir engineering. Recently uh, Bassam uh, completed a PhD at Heriot Watt which was published in the AG proceedings and is now developing a, uh, a rock typing web page. Came up with the idea of a ternary rock typing plot uh, and there we're using three parameters porosity, permeability and irreducible water saturation so that's the uh, link 
uh, with the capillary pressure curve coming in. And you see that uh, on a ternary plot, if we show you this, on a ternary plot you would see in an ideal model that are different, in this case carbonate facies would have plot as different ellipses on this ternary diagram. The software that Bassam has developed uh, allows you to identify uh, a particular rock typing scheme. Here we're using the, the global hydraulic elements to illustrate uh, and you can see there on various plots in a consistent color you can see uh, the uh, rock typing scheme that comes from the global hydraulic element. But of course this is only one of many rock typing schemes so you need to be able to change quickly to see how a different rock typing scheme, Lucia, might be distributed throughout your reservoir and you might find that that's a more appropriate use uh, in a particular reservoir. So uh, during Bassam's thesis he went on to look at uh, a simulation model case where he built a whole model going through a consistent rock typing framework uh, and for one type of rock typing scheme and a second type of rock typing scheme. In fact his thesis has a number of rock typing schemes. So he was able then to compare uh, the production curves, the uh, water cut performance and the recovery factor for the different rock typing schemes. And the key point to take away from here is just the range of uh, recovery uh, factors that were found different recovery factors that were found uh, for the different rock typing schemes. Uh, another uh, commercial piece of software that is out there from Geo2Flow uh, would allow you also to work with the capillary pressure data to cluster that capillary pressure data in a complex field or the saturation data, uh, porosity and permeability data to identify uh, J functions that could be related to uh, J facies, which would be uh, sort of more petrophacies rather than lithophacies, and uh, then linking this to the prediction of permeability as well. So Tanamara has produced a very nice paper in 2019 summarizing all of the uh, issues around uh, rock typing and his uh, nine rules that he presents at the end pretty much come down to say that it's the J function that is all powerful in rock typing for the engineers. Essentially this function relates capillary pressure, surface tension, contact angle and R, RQI, RK over phi. So the idea is if you've got a distribution of K over phi within the reservoir and you know the J function you should have everything you need. So when we look at uh, capillary pressure in a carbonate reservoir, we see a massive range of capillary pressure data uh, for the very many different types of rock that we have in the reservoir. But if you collapse that onto a J function, you see there's a much narrower range. Similarly, in a clastic reservoir, a whole number of uh, capillary pressure curves come down to a relatively narrow range again. And, you know, from that narrow range, one can come up with three perhaps uh, bracketing J functions that you would be able to use in your reservoir which would cover most of the nine separate uh, reservoir types that you think you have. So I encourage you to have a look at that paper and understand the engineering impact of the rock typing process. So my final comments are that rock typing is essentially petrophysical clustering. There are many techniques in use by geologists, petrophysicists and engineers. Some are two-parameter, some are three-parameter. Some take power of these dimensionless J-curve. It's crucial petrophysical link between the geology and the engineering. Controls the oil in place, the flow properties, and uh, obviously there are some additional upscaling challenges that need to take on board because some of these rock types occur, as you've seen, in very, very small scales. For effective reservoir characterization, you do need to take some type of rock typing, and that would rather depend on the time you have available, I guess, and the data you have available. I'll leave you with one final statement, perhaps. For me, summing it all up, 
Rock typing is the process of identifying the rock quality index location in the 3D reservoir volume, allowing for calibration by water saturation at those locations, and sets up the framework for the all-powerful J-curve to initialize the simulation models most effectively. So finally, when you are asking about uh, how many rock types there are, then you have to think whether the person asking the question is a petrophysicist, a reservoir engineer, or a geologist. Thank you for that.